New Testament scripture for this morning comes from John chapter 13, beginning in verse 18. I am not referring to all of you. I know those I have chosen. But this is to fill the scripture. He who shares my bread has lifted up his heel against me. I am telling you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am he. I tell you the truth, whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me, and whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. After he had said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, I tell you the truth, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which of them he meant. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and said, Ask him which one he means. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, son of Simon. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. What you are going about to do Do quickly, Jesus told him. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas had had charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the feast or to give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out, and it was night. Thus ends New Testament reading for this morning. Let us go to our God in prayer once more. Lord, we humbly ask that you would bless us through the hearing of your word. Indeed, that you would soften our hearts hearts to hear what it is that you would have us say. That your Holy Spirit would accompany your word and work within us that which you would have us to do. And we pray all of this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. This morning we come to a difficult text. Um, some of you may be wondering how it is so, you know, how it can be so that I would say that this is difficult. Um, after all, there's no really difficult questions raised in this text. There's no uh, particularly confusing sayings of the Christ in these verses, like in other places that we've seen in John's Gospel. In fact, everything about this text seems pretty straightforward and plain and clear. There's nothing really hidden from our sight. And so it's not difficult, literarily speaking, it's not difficult to understand what is happening. Again, this text seems very straightforward. We comprehend what is going on. But you see, people of God, as you... Put yourself in the place of these men who are here, these first centuries people. The difficulty lies in the question, why? Why would Christ allow this to take place? Why must these things be? I mean, this is an extremely painful reality in and of itself, and we will explore that in detail this morning. What is happening here is that Christ will be betrayed not by his enemies, not by those who hate him, which would be much easier for us to accept, but Christ instead is to be betrayed by a friend, a dear, close friend, one who has spent every waking moment with the Christ for the last three years, who is, as we'll see, for all intents and purposes, indiscernible from the rest of the disciples, a genuine Follower, follower of Christ, by all appearances at least. And all this time, Christ has known, all these years that he has walked with Judas, Christ has known what would happen this night and how things were leading to this moment. moment. He knew that this hour would come and he is deeply troubled and pained with the reality of what we will witness tonight. And you see 
people of God, therein lies the difficulty of the text. The sense of this moment of great pain, a deep wound to our Lord. And the question we must ask is, why must it be so? What does it mean for us? The text opens up this morning, and the first thing that we see is the heel of a friend. The heel of a friend. As you come uh, to chapter 13, you'll remember that this night is the Passover night, something that will come into play later on in this text. It's a very significant backdrop to this whole scene that will unfold. And Christ is sitting or reclining with his disciples at the Passover meal, a meal uh, that looks back and it speaks a word over the people of God that this about this lamb that they are about to eat, this paschal lamb whose body was broken for them, who shed blood, allowed the people of God to pass from death into life. And this is the same meal Christ will instruct his disciples to take this bread and drink this cup and to do this and remember it to me at this very meal that we are witnessing. It will all point back to himself. This night we've witnessed Christ wash the feet of his disciples humbling himself into the form of a servant, calling his children then to imitate him, laying down their lives for the good of one another because a servant is no greater than his master. All of this is going on. While the, and while the feet of the disciples are still drying, Christ says in verse 18, I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, meaning I know the ones whom are my own. I know the, those of you who are clean, who I'm calling to live this humble life with me. The, and one of you is not called to this same calling. One of you in my midst will hand the Lord and giver of life into the hand of the enemy. Christ has already been alluding to this betrayal, and he will continue to flesh it out more throughout this text. We have been warned back in verses 11 and 12 that Christ told us that not all of you are clean after he has washed all their feet, meaning there is something inside of one of them that makes him unclean. And he says it because he knew he would be betrayed, and he knew who his betrayer would be. In fact, we've known this would be the case since back in chapter 6, when Christ says, Did I not choose you, the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil. Christ has known for a long time coming now that he would be betrayed, and who his betrayer would be. It never escaped him, not for a moment that this would take place, but he tells us now for two reasons. So that when these things take place, when all this happened, and his betrayal is actually at hand, Christ's disciples, as they look back upon the whole situation, will remember that even in these things, Christ had control over his own life, that as the good shepherd, he alone lays down his life and takes it up again, that it was not outside of his will that these things took place. Christ isn't surprised when Judas betrays him. So Christ, in part, he tells his disciples to encourage their faith in him, to know that he is the Messiah, even this end was foreseen by Christ. But not only has it been foreseen, it has been foreordained. It has been planned. You see, Christ also tells us of his betrayal so that we might know that the scriptures will be fulfilled. That these things that have been long foretold about, that have been uh, foretold long ago, these events you are about to witness that have been planned by the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit before time even began, before the world was formed and the foundations of the world, that this has always been the plan of God, that the Son of God might be betrayed at the hand of not an enemy, but of a friend. And then he quotes, from Psalm 41, this text that we read this morning together, he quotes a psalm written by the king of Israel about a king who is being or would be persecuted. An anointed king whose close friend would lie or lift up his heel against him, even the one who had eaten bread with him. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean when Christ references this text? What does it mean that he would raise his heel against him, against this anointed king. That image of a heel being raised, it, it is a war image. Um, 
it's often softened from this, but it is an image of two warring parties fighting against one another. And when this would happen in the Old Testament context, in the ancient Near East, when one nation had conquered the other, the king of the losing side would admit defeat, and he would da bow down before the other king on the ground. And the victorious king would raise his foot and place his heel upon the neck of the fallen king. Now that's what you have going on in this particular psalm. In verse 8, it says, he will not rise again from where he lies. Meaning he has been defeated. He is in the, the, uh, the moment of utter defeat. And then you, so you have this image of this anointed king who has been cast down upon the ground. He has seemingly been defeated. And it is his friend who has, who has supped with him, who has dined with him, who has had fellowship with him and unity with him, who raises his heel and places it upon the neck of this anointed king. To show that he holds the king and his kingdom and the power of his own homage. The imagery is very vivid imagery. What is most disturbing about this whole situation is not that it is the enemy who has put his feet upon the neck of the king. It is his friend who betrays him, who raises his heel against him. Not just his enemy. One who has supped with him who has dined with him in fellowship, who has broken bread with him. Again, that imagery of breaking bread together, of eating a morsel together, this imagery of a shared meal, it, it may not mean much to us, but in the ancient world, this is a huge breach of, of faith. Now, there's a book series that came out a few years ago called Game of Thrones, and it picks up on this kind of ancient practice. So in this story, there are seven kingdoms that war against each other to try to gain control of the throne. And one kingdom breaches faith with another. The young king of the north was pledged to be married to a girl from the house of Fry, and he broke faith. He married another woman. And this king of the north, he goes to plead his case with the Fry household and ask forgiveness, trying to repair the damage that he has done. And as he does so, the king's mother pleads with him repeatedly to be sure to break bread with the Lord in the house of Fry, because it was an ancient sign of hospitality that no harm would come to him while he was under the house of another Lord. This was an ancient practice of unity, at least for the very moment that they were seated together. The image is one of two people who are being united in common faith and love, and to break that contract is a heinous crime. There are very few crimes that are as ugly as this. There is nothing lovely or commendable about it. It is a shocking turn of events. In fact, in that series, The Game of Thrones, one of the most grotesque moments is when the Fries murder and destroy the king of the, um, the, king of the north in his own household after they have pledged him safety. We don't really need uh, to see that. We understand, I think, oftentimes instinctively how heinous this particular crime is for a friend to betray a friend, for one who is trusted, for one who is loyal to hand over another friend for personal profit, for personal gain. Even the culture around us knows that there is something horribly wrong with betraying a friend and the loyalty of a friendship for a prophet. You know, what Judas does here to the Christ is so horrible that the name Judas will forever be synonymous for a betrayal of the darkest kind, so much so that you hear the name Judas uh, just used as uh, synonymous with betrayal. Uh, this is picked up on by songwriters. If you sing a song like, uh, you know, from Nazareth that says, Please don't Judas me, everyone knows what that means. Don't betray me. Don't hand me over to my enemies. And Christ says, what you are about to witness must take place. The heel of my friend will be upon my neck in order that the word of God might be fulfilled. In order that you might believe. All is according to the foreknowledge and wisdom of God. Foreknowledge and wisdom of God. Verse 21, Christ is deeply troubled, and you can imagine why. 
His betrayer is at hand. And he tells us that he is troubled, and it is in the same way as he was troubled when he considered Lazarus, who was lying in the grave, that he, he is deeply moved, and he is deeply pained and burdened. And so much so that he says, one of you will betray me. He lets the cat out of the bag. He discusses exactly what will take place. And the disciples, they're taken back by this. This is uh, news to them. T uh, it's a little bit of a surprise. And they look around at each other and have no idea who Jesus is speaking about. They are clueless. Give us a little insight. You know, it gives you a little, it, it should give you a little insight into Judas. Judas appeared on the surface just as faithful as the rest of the disciples. He looked just like them. He walked just like them. He talked just like them. No one suspected his heart because on the outside, he seemed just like all the rest of those who were closest to Christ. You could not discern his heart because only God sees the heart. As Christ looks upon the heart, he knows his betrayer, whom for the last three years treated him just as he treated Christ, treated Judas just the same way as he treated all the rest of his dearest friends who are gathered around him, knowing what would come. This is so much the case that as the disciples look around, they do not know who it is. They have no clue who the portrayer is. So as the disciples are reclining at the table, that was the practice of the day. You would, uh, you would lay down with your elbow on your side, and as you ate, your head would come up to uh, about your neighbor's chest. And so John, as he sits next to Christ, as he is on the left hand, he just leans back, basically putting his head on Christ's bosom after Peter kind of signals to him, hey, you know, figure out who this is. He kind of gives him some um, body language that, hey, who is this? Who, who's he talking about? And so John leans back, he rests his head upon the Savior, and he asks very privately, not for any of the others to hear, who is the one? Who is it, Lord? Who is it that will betray you? And Jesus answers him just as privately, not for all the others to hear, the one whom I give this morsel of bread to. And he hands the bread to Judas. And we can't be 100% sure, but just think about it for a moment. Where must Judas be in relation to Christ right now? Where is he sitting? Seated. Remember, they are reclining at the table. You can just picture for yourself, lay down on the floor on your side. And Jesus is not going to get up and stand and walk around the table to the far side and hand Judas a piece of bread. Judas must be within arm's reach of Christ. And the most likely place for him to sit without uh, causing any sort of debacle as he passes the bread to him is beside him. John is on Christ's left hand, but it is most likely Judas who is seated at the right, even in the very seat of honor in that day. And he receives the bread from Christ. Now that's just speculation, but it's very plausible. But again, the image that you are supposed to see here is that this is an intimate, trusted friend who will hand over Christ to the enemies of God. Christ has placed Judas close enough at hand to give him this morsel of bread in order that the word of God, Psalm 41, might stand truly fulfilled. And the text tells us Satan, a dragon of old, the oldest, most vile enemy of God, enters into Judas, and Christ says, Do what you must. And do it quickly. And Judas rises, and he goes, and the disciples think, now he's either going out uh, to get something to prepare for the upcoming feast of leavened bread, which follows the Passover meal, or he's going to give something to the poor. They have no idea what's going on. It may seem odd to you that they would think that he's going to give money to the poor, but it was the custom to give alms to the poor on Passover night. At midnight, the temple gates would be open for beggars to gather there, and people would come to the temple and give gifts from them. They would give alms to the poor. And Judas is the money changer, and so they assume there's a, everything is above board. Everything is on the table. And so Judas rises, and he immediately goes out into the darkness of night. And surely it is nighttime, but John has been teasing out this imagery 
of light and darkness all throughout his gospel. You cannot miss this. So Judas rises and he leaves the presence of the light of the world whom he is sitting next to and he is swallowed up into the outer darkness as he departs from the presence of the Lord to hand him over to God's enemies. What are we to think as all of this is taking place? What does Christ want us to understand about this most wicked of all actions that leads to the greatest sin in the history of the world when the only truly innocent man is handed over. He is slain for deeds he has not done. I mean, how are you to read this text? What is it that we are to see with the eyes of faith as this all unfolds? The people of God, remember, all this unfolds when? On Passover night. The night when the people of God to look back at their history of who they are and say to one another, remember, remember how in the days of old Israel was enslaved and in bondage and we had no hope, how we were lost, but God went to war on our behalf. He would destroy all the enemies of God and cast them down one by one. Each idol of Egypt would fall down before him, each false god being slayed before him as the plagues, plagues demonstrated He had power over them, and God had his foot upon the neck of his enemies in that instant. Pharaoh, the instrument of the devil, was cast down. His army could not pursue them through the waters of judgment. That is what God's people are to remember as they sit down to eat this meal, that the enemy of God was cast out, and God's people were delivered from bondage. They remembered that cosmic warfare was at play, even as it is now. What will unfold before us? Make no mistake. It is a battle between the God of everything and the devil himself. The ancient of foes. What hangs in the balance is not just Israel of old anymore, but it is the fate of the whole world. And what do we expect to see? We should expect to see the dragon of old cast down, to see our Lord and Messiah victorious over him. But instead, we see the anointed king lay down upon the ground and allow the dragon of old to place his foot upon the neck of our king as he leads him directly to the cross. This does not seem like a victory does not seem like the victory that Psalm 41 leads to, but the reality of the situation is that it is. And that it is indeed a victory that is won, in that it is by dying, by life, that life will come. It is by losing that God wins. It is that the, the story of the gospel does not end at the cross. You might be tempted to think that old devil has won, but notice, even in our text, everything that happens, happens according to God's plan, according to his will. Will. Did you notice Satan could do nothing in this text until Christ commanded him to go and do what he must quickly? Satan is not equal to God, but can do nothing which God has not ordained. Dear children of God, in the words of one of my Dear friends and mentors, Jesse Purcell, do you understand that God is so in control of this world that Satan, even the greatest enemy of our souls, the greatest enemy that can come against us, can do nothing without God's leave to do so? Do you understand that? That even this this greatest of all evils where the God-man will die on the cross at the hands of sinful men, even in this, God has a plan to bring good from it. And it is that through this seeming defeat that he has won. That through the cross, this grotesque and heinous of all evils, through this tragedy, God might do good for you. You might be freed from the bondage of the evil one, that all who would believe upon him might be saved, even as John 3.16 has laid out for us. And if that is true, dear Christian, then God really means it when he says he works all things together for good.
even the things that are in our life that hurt, that are painful, even when we are faced with something that makes us cry out, is his plan for me still good? We can take it to the bank that no matter what we might face, our God cares for us. Because if he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not with him graciously give us all things? See, people of God, the Father has put all things under Christ's feet. Everything. Satan himself is under Christ's feet. The role is reversed. Through Christ's death, he places his foot upon the enemy. He places his foot upon the enemy of death. Nothing is over him. All things are under his foot. And if that is true, people of God, be comforted. When troubles assail us, when dangers of fright, the friends should all fail us, and foes all unite. Yet one thing incurs us, whatever betide, the promise assures us the Lord will provide, and he has already provided for you, people of God. And the Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, in whom we put our trust. Amen. Let us pray. Oh Lord, we come before you humbled at how sovereignly you reign. All things work to your good, even though we cannot see it, even though we cannot lift our eyes beyond this horizon and understand what it is that you are doing. We pray, Father, that you would increase our faith to know that you are working these things for our good and to your own glory. And help us to see the one who is seated at the right hand of God, the one who reigns victorious over all the enemies of God. Father, as we walk through this life, we pray that you would cause us to walk by faith, not by sight, that we would remember who it is that has the victory at the end of all days. And may that end inform all the in-between times. And we pray all of this in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.